welcome to the Herbal Hour podcast. We have uh, Dr. Shannon Curtis back on. Uh, hello, how are you? Hi, I'm great. It's so good to be back on again. Last time we chatted all about medical astrology and herbalism, so that was a fun topic. Yes, and uh, and today we're we're going deep into a few topics. Uh, one of them that I wanted to talk about, since you've been telling me that you've been working with a lot of patients with acne, is. Uh, your approach to acne and I wanted to talk a little bit about the holistic view towards acne because as uh, as naturopaths I know that skin disorders we view them much differently than maybe other people do absolutely yeah when it comes to skin there's a variety of different causes right there are so many different root causes and the skin is like the reflection of our inner body it just shows everything that's going on inside. So I think of like the skin as like the reflection of well, one, our inner gut. Our gut is like our inner skin. So what is going on with our gut? There's um, also a lot of things going on with hormonal imbalances when mm -hmm. it comes to skin. So with the skin, I focus a lot on the neuroendocrine system. And what that means is the nervous system and the hormonal or endocrine system and how they interact. And there's actually like a big part of um, the gut is impacted by the neuroendocrine system. So if you address the neuroendocrine system, you can focus on healing the gut and how that interacts with the skin. Um, with that being said, another thing with the skin that I focus on is um, the organs of the organs of elimination or the emunctories. Are you familiar with those? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so for those who aren't familiar, the organs of elimination or the emunctories are those organs that um, naturally, that's our body's like natural way of detoxification, of elimination, mm -hmm. how we move things through the body, whether that be like cellular waste products or um, which are natural byproducts of metabolism, or if there are, you know, environmental toxins, things our body accumulates, how we detoxify medications. So the big driver of that is our liver. That's the big go-to organ. And then from the liver, those metabolites get sent to the kidneys, they get to be excreted via the urine, to the colon or large intestine to be excreted um, as solid waste, or to the lungs to be excreted as gaseous waste, and actually also through the skin. So as you know, our largest organ, our skin is an organ of elimination as well. And in health, you know, the skin is sweating and is able to discharge waste that way. When things aren't healthy, either with our organs of elimination or with our neuroendocrine system, um, the skin can you know, manifest with throwing off things you know, like acne, eczema, psoriasis, um, rosacea will start to appear. Yeah, that's these emunctories. I think it's really important to note that they're the true uh, pathway of detoxification. So mm -hmm. detox in general has become this kind of woo woo thing where every product claims that it detoxes, but really all detoxification uh, is, is how your body, especially your liver kind of converts uh, chemicals through the cytochrome system into more inert chemicals for, you know, getting rid of storing in the fat or urinating out or sweating out, et cetera. So if you actually work on the liver specifically, there is true detoxification. I know there's a lot of people mm -hmm. in the more mainstream sides of medicine that say, oh, there's no such thing as detox. Oh, point out what what's a toxin? Well, I mean, basically anything far into the body that causes damage is a toxin. You can exactly they call them toxicants in environmental medicine if mm -hmm. if one wants to be very specific. But they do exist and our body's always dealing with them. Mm -hmm. And I, I love this idea I learned uh when I was in naturopathic school that it's kind of like this bucket. Toxins are this bucket where they fill up from all sorts of sources from what you're eating, you know, drinking, breathing, how you're living. And drop by drop by drop, it overflows. And that's when you start having a disease condition. Okay. But it, there's no way to get rid of all toxic influence. Uh, in fact, that will probably cause you issues with just being mentally stable because you'll find out like everything is basically poisoning you more or less. But it's about reducing the amount of those drops so that the body can deal with it. Because what's amazing about the body and liver is that it can deal with some pretty crazy amounts of toxins and still function relatively normally. So I know our bodies are made for that. Our bodies were made to metabolize and detoxify and, and actually, you know, just the contaminants that naturally occur in our environment are like mild stressors to our system. And that can actually upregulate pathways. Right. You know, we talk about some of these 
um, some of these molecules in plants or even in the soil, like micro doses of like little lead and all these types of things are actually little tiny toxic stimulants to upregulate pathways that then can make us healthier and clear our bodies of, of more junk, right? Um, yeah. But with that being said, like we can't, especially in our modern day, we can't avoid all of these things that are coming at us. Um, we're going to get some no matter how healthy we are, no matter how pure of water we drink or food we eat or medications we don't take. Um, it's just an inevitable part of, of living in this modern day. But that is a big part of, of skincare and hormonal balance is like, how do we balance our, um, our toxic load? How do we reduce our intake and how do we promote um, and improve our, our elimination? You, you bring up a really interesting point. And I want to ask you the uh, question on this. Do you think that actually removing all toxins, if it was possible, would even be healthy with, with the, obviously the stimulating effect that small amounts of different toxins have on kind of supporting the liver function, keeping it nice and strong and enzymes up to date. Uh, do you think that actually removing all toxins from life would actually even be beneficial or is a little bit helpful for the body? I don't think to- it'd be possible. Like even our ancestors, like way back before we had, you know, fossil fuels and, or used fossil fuels in our cars and, and you know, had all these pharmaceutical medications and polluted our water. You know, we, our soil naturally had, you know, some levels of lead and arsenic and mm-hmm. these heavy metals, um, you know, things, things that are, you know, in excess damaging to our body, but in tiny, tiny micro, like nan- nanograms, like picograms, even um, parts per million, parts per billion um, in these tiny doses are actually, they have like a homeostatic or homeodynamic effect on our body. Um, so there is a purpose for mm-hmm. These, these these things, but um, yeah, I, I to answer your question, I don't think it'd be possible, and, and yeah, yeah, I don't think it'd be easy, but yeah. I think we're far away from that point. <laughs> it brings up this kind of interesting concept of, you know, even with, um, you know, inflammatory aspects or mm-hmm. things that are oxidizing, or um, just really stresses on the body in any sense. It mm-hmm. seems that if you were even able to remove all of them these stresses, it would not be a healthy body because those little stresses are actually what makes the body strong, right? Like, uh, obviously when you lift weights, it tears your muscles. This is bad, right? But it's not bad because it makes us stronger. Or when you fast, that's bad, right? You should always eat food. You should always be, but no, fasting actually helps you clear your system, keeps you kind of strong, uh, fixes the metabolic imbalances you may have. So it's like these little stresses are actually can be very healing, even like cold exposure, heat exposure, there's this recurring theme of a uh, small level exposure makes you stronger and healthier. Even mm-hmm. a lot of plant compounds in higher doses are toxic. And homeopathy is, uh, as, as you know, it's, it's based around using these toxic substances, but in super, super, super dilute doses, because there's this idea that somehow, you know, uh, if it's toxic at this dose, but at this dose, at a lower dose, it causes like a counter response that is actually healing. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's just some really good points. I mean, that's, what's great about using homeopathy and uh, is something that I, I use largely in my practice and work with patients and clients because it can stimulate that healing response, right? Some homeopathics, it depends on the potency, but could be in that part per million or part per billion dose where it goes in and it's acting like this like little irritant, right? But like a chemical messenger almost. It's giving the body information. The body is adapting to it. And I like what you said about how, um, you know, we talk about cold plunges and all these things that are like stressors on the body, right? Mm-hmm. They're stressors. They, 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 um, they help promote health in their own right. But then we're always talking about got to reduce stress, right? You can't have to, no stress in your life. Stress is bad. Stress is the source right, of all right. things. When in fact, it's just like our response to stress. It's just how are we managing that reaction? And, um, you know, with that being said, there's this, like, we think that, that we exist on this like homeostatic plane that we have this one point where we're at and, you know, we move in any direction and we, we experience disease. Well, it's not like homeostasis. It's our bodies trying to have this like homeo, um, I've heard the term homeodynamicism, I think is Mm. what it is. I might be saying that wrong, but instead of like the set point that we're always supposed to be at, it's this like fluctuating, we're constantly being thrown into new territories, new experiences, like new environmental insults. It's like, how can we experience this grounded place of health and centeredness amid all of that? 
So mm. it's not just one set point. It's like, how, how can we manage to move along in life and still remain centered? Right, still health? remain uh, balanced. There's some interesting research about stress that uh, when I was kind of studying into the HP access and adaptogenic herbs mm -hmm. uh, that really blew my mind. Because if this is true, it's kind of revolutionary in terms of uh, how we deal with stress. Mm -hmm. And uh, the research was basically showing that stress is either good or bad. So uh, I think the words are uh, use stress, like good stress and distress. It's good or bad, not depending on what the stress is, but depending on how one perceives it. If one yeah. perceives it as beneficial, it's good stress. If one perceives it as bad, it's bad stress. Meaning literally that outside stress, what makes it good or bad for your body is just how you perceive it. So like, you know, when you do like a hard workout, you're in a lot of pain, but you know that it's good for you. So that stress doesn't have the same health uh, negative effects as the kind of stress would have that, you know, you you know, you fell down and you hurt yourself and you didn't mean to, and you thought it was so bad and it ruined your day. That kind of stress will actually make you sick. Same damage, but the perception is different. Or even uh, how we deal with the stresses in our lives, whether we think, oh, this is a chance for me to like really become stronger, to overcome a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, if we think instead that, oh, like I can't do this too much for me. I'm too stressed out. This is making me sick. Um, then that will actually make us sick. So I thought that was really interesting that there's this deep perceptive element to what makes stress good or bad for us. Yeah, isn't that true? The mind, the, the mind and our emotions and just our, our patterning when it comes to that plays such a big role in stress perception and how we react and um, the resulting impact it has on our nervous system and our, our hormonal system. I'm, I'm curious, have you, um, have you, with, with working with clients like that, patients like that, have you used adaptogenic herbs or other herbs to help with that stress response and seeing good results? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, adaptogenic herbs, I think, are probably the class of herbs that everyone should pretty much take, at least in terms of uh, within the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. So some of the ones that I found most uh, successful are uh, ashwagandha is probably my favorite one. It's really mild. It's very uh, simple herb. It, it helps balance, obviously, that HPA axis we were talking about, which is how the brain communicates with the adrenals and uh, regulates cortisol, stress hormone release. Uh, and that system gets out of whack really easily when there's kind of chronic stress and it's never addressed. Um, ashwagandha is really good because it's very kind of tonic and it's kind of mm -hmm. neutral in its energetics. It's not like hot. It's not cold, meaning it's not super stimulating. It's not super sedating. It's this kind of tonic herb that you take over time and it kind of builds up fortitude. So if one's going to take any adaptogen uh, and they're not really sure which one to take, ashwagandha is I, it's a uh, go-to. It is a... I'd say it's a little bit on the uh, relaxing side. So sometimes I would like to take it at night. I remember yeah. I, I would take it in the mornings. Like I would take a really big dose of it, probably like 10 grams of the powder. Ooh, yeah. And I would get so sleepy. So so it, it could be pretty sedating. But those are, those are some of my favorites. Also, rhodiola huh? and uh, Siberian ginseng. I like Siberian ginseng also. Uh, it's another one that's kind of like neutral energetics, whereas like the other the other ginsengs are really hot, meaning they're very stimulating. They're, you know, go, go, go. And rhodiola is like off the charts hot, like stimulating because, uh, you know, I made this. Um, so one of the blends I made, it's called Herculean Strength. It has rhodiola, ashwagandha, um, and eleuthero or Siberian ginseng. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I was making this uh, brew in a commercial kitchen and I took a bunch of it because I was tasting it because I'm constantly taste testing it because I add raw honey into it to make it how taste much, good. How much is the bunch? How much what? How much is the bunch? How much did you take? Oh, I took, uh, I don't even know, probably like a shot's worth of it. And this is like pure tincture, right? So yeah. that's like, you know, like a, a whole bottle probably, like a one ounce bottle. And man, it was late too because I was working pretty late. I like, I had so much energy. I literally just like couldn't stop myself from doing push-ups. I was like, oh, I just want to do push-ups right now. And I didn't really like connect two and two together. Like I just kind of was tasting it, tasting it. And then suddenly mm -hmm. I just got like this urge to do push-ups. Then I did them. I'm like, oh, it's because I just drank so much of this. So anyway, those ones are very stimulating. So you, you know, the common recommendation for Odeal is don't take it at night. Or if you have a lot of anxiety, that kind of thing, which adaptogenic herbs do you like? You should put a little side effect one in on there. This may cause you to want to do push-ups. Yes, may may cause spontaneous push-ups. At like midnight. <laughs>
<laughs> no, those are all some great herbs. And, you know, when I'm working with my clients and my patients with um, a lot of, a lot of women come to see me and a lot of them have um, acne, hormonal acne, hormone problems, period problems, you name it. I'm working on that HPA access most of the time because yeah, there's probably like some dominant hormonal imbalance going on. But you know, when it comes down to it, all the hormones are interconnected and there's usually something kind of going on with the way the brain is communicating to the to either the thyroid and also the adrenals and the ovaries. And that's where those herbs come in. But I love ashwagandha. I think it's great. I use ashwagandha a lot when I see kind of like this elevated cortisol pattern, like mm -hmm. women that are people that have, you know, a hard time going to sleep at night. Yep. They kind of have that wired and tired. Maybe it's like stage that. one of the kind of stress response where exactly. it's like, they're just really, really anxious, wired, wired. Then the mm -hmm. next one is, you know, the where, exhaustion. Yeah, yeah, exhausted. before they get to the exhaustion, let's catch yeah. them there. And with the ashwagandha, you know, if they're waking up a lot at night to pee and they just kind of then feel exhausted the next day, the ashwagandha can be really good for those. I also really like for people that tend to have like a functional low height, low thyroid um, function can be useful for that too. I love making ashwagandha lattes at night, you know, like putting a little bit of like yep. warm, milk, some ashwagandha, a little, maybe yep. a little honey cardamom, something like that. Super delicious. The nice. the formula I make, I love adding it into, uh, into coffee, especially when I was finishing up uh, mm -hmm. uh, naturopathic medical school, which was, it was just crazy because we were doing everything online and it was, it was like, it was like hell three months. Uh, oh, yeah. But every day I was, I was uh, adding the adaptogenic blend to coffee just because it helped kind of level out like the kind of jitteriness stress response from the coffee because i was just drinking so much coffee i basically had to 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 get through everything like i just was working all day every day so um it makes sense and then you spend the next few years of your life trying to figure out your adrenals after that yeah exactly yeah you, you basically try to fix all the damage you did in school <laughs> Well, I, I, yeah, I love ad uh, adaptogens. I think they're wonderful, De depending on the pattern of the individual and like their, you know, constitution, if they tend mm. to you know, be more wired and tired or more just exhausted and burnt out, um, yeah. there's different adaptogens that can be more useful for them. And that can, you know, the stress response plays a huge role in, in hormonal balance and, and skin condition. Yeah. I like uh, a lot of the non-traditional adaptogens, you know, the ones that are kind of called adaptogens, but no one really- uh... oh, Like which ones? um like licorice mm -hmm. like um what's it called it's that uh that chinese medicine berry shisandra shisandra yeah. they're considered uh, adaptogens in some sense because they kind of help the body balance out especially licorice licorice is probably it's probably one of the best herbs of all time because it does it's, so many things and so uh in chinese medicine they put licorice in every single formula because they really think that it uh, helps with the uh, synergy of other uh yeah. plant effects <laughs> Mm -hmm. Plus it's very moistening, moistening. So, you know, yeah. a lot of herbs tend to be drying. So it kind of complements that and exactly drives it to where it needs to yeah, go. Yeah. Very, very kind of like, uh, so like the, the moist energetics for people, mm -hmm. uh, and like damp for people who don't aren't familiar with the energetic system. Uh, it means that it's kind of like nourishing to the body because the dry state in general is this atrophic state, meaning kind of like this withered, dried out, like weak state. So any kind of damp herb helps kind of build up this, uh, you know, that, that vital dampness of the body, let's, let's say, cause life mm -hmm. is, uh, is hot and damp. That's like what life is, right? That's right. Yeah. We need our fluids. We need fluids for nutrients to get into cells. We need fluids for hormonal transport, right? You know, fat and, 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 and water do mix in a sense in the body. And so, you know, if our cells are dried out or organs are dried out, tissues are dried out, it's like, you know, they're not getting the nutrients they need, things are in balance, you know, and you host of, of effects you don't want. So while we're uh, talking about herbs, uh, mm -hmm. what are some of your favorite herbs for helping with uh, skin issues oh. and also hormones? Like what are your go-to ones? Oh, okay. That's a loaded question because there's a bunch. There's a Please. bunch. And it depends we have time. On, yeah, it, de it depends on patterns. It depends mm -hmm. on what's going on. Let's talk about acne first. Okay. Um, so with acne, I try to like, well, one, I try to just like figure out what's the root cause. Is there like a hormonal imbalance that's driving it primarily? For some people, for many people, there is. Um, and a lot of times I see women, especially that come off of birth control and they develop acne. And the primary driver behind that type of acne, two things. Um, hormonal would be estrogen dominance. So that's when you have too much estrogen in the body. Birth control is a fake estrogen and it, you know, your body accumulates it over time. So you have too much estrogen in the body related to progesterone. 
Um, the other thing that I see with um, acne and especially post birth control acne is um, impairments of the liver function mm -hmm. because birth control for one definitely puts a damper on the liver. It has to process all those hormones and everything. And it, you know, it augments certain CYP pathways while downregulating others, you know, to be able to keep up with demand. Um, so I see some functional liver impairment with that. So when it comes to acne and herbs, um, addressing estrogen dominance via focusing on elimination of those estrogens, mm. primarily through the liver. So I love hepatic herbs. I love all sorts of hepatic herbs that, um, that can promote uh, natural detoxification of those hormones. So things like milk thistle can be really mm. good. Uh, burdock root, dandelion root, all of like our um, alternative roots yes. and uh, those seeds of the thistle plants can be really helpful uh, for liver detoxification. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, this uh, blend that I just actually released this week, uh, it's like a kind of detox blend, it's called Dionysian Detox. It mm. has uh, milk thistle, it has uh, burdock root, it has dandelion root, um, and then it has kind of some flavoring. I think it has some orange peel and uh, mm -hmm. and ginger to help. Oh, and it also has artichoke leaf. So the artichoke leaf was like really bitter and like mm -hmm. rough. So uh, I kind of added a, a bunch of orange peel and ginger to kind of overcome the flavor. And it's in a tea? Uh, it's a tincture. It's a tincture. So it's an extract. Oh, that's yeah. perfect. That's yeah. perfect. The artichoke it's is great you mm -hmm. know because i feel like that really help rounds it out because a lot of those herbs are going to have more of an affinity to um the liver more of a hepatic mm -hmm. affin affinity while the artichoke is really good um for the gallbladder like i feel like it just has more of an affinity to the gallbladder some to the liver yeah yeah i kind of uh, in formulating it i was really like thinking of what are the herbs that um will really help the function of the liver so like obviously the milk thistle it increases liver function, but also is very protective for the liver. So that's like, that's like our, you know, foundational herb there. Cause it kind of just puts a nice protection on the liver. So if it's already under a lot of insult and then the other herbs are very useful for uh, kind of clearing out issues in the liver and kind of, as you were saying with the gallbladder and mm -hmm. things of that nature. It sounds um, like it'd be a great blend for hormonal imbalances, especially post birth control. Cause I really love to focus on my gallbladder with post birth control and post birth control acne. But, um, I know I, I, I talk about those herbs all the time and I think people are like, oh, okay, like, yeah, sure, I'll take those herbs. But like, I've seen them work time and time again when it comes to skin conditions and when it comes to hormone imbalances. And like, I myself, I have a tea that has a lot of those same herbs mm -hmm. in it that I, I call it my Jupiter detox tea, probably know why. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I have a tea that I, I literally, whenever I feel like, okay, I've maybe been indulging a bit too much. I've been too much Jupiter in my life. Like I'm, I, I feel like my skin is unhealthy or like I have an, a zip forming or something. I literally drink this tea and like the next day, everything's better. Like time and time again, it just works. Yeah. It's cool too that the, if you look at the liver energetically, like if you look at it from Chinese medicine, it's, mm -hmm. uh, they call it uh, the general and it's, it's the place of the kind of spirit of the body uh, of like motivation ambition like clear thinking in fact it's a very thought of as a very like spiritual organ so if you're if your liver is unhealthy you uh energetically you feel you're not connected to your life you don't know what your purpose is you feel lost you feel like mm -hmm. low energy so that's like the energetic side of the liver so it's it's cool too to to look at the organs as uh corresponding with kind of psycho spiritual uh states because you know it's you don't only treat the liver just because somebody has liver damage or cirrhosis or because they drink alcohol or whatever, but because mm -hmm. maybe they, they feel like, you know, they don't have their spiritual connection, especially to the kind of, I believe in Chinese medicine, it, it's the house of the, um, of the, uh, corporeal soul, like the, the animal soul lives in the liver. So like the Is deep, the like hmm? with the will, or am I thinking gallbladder? well maybe i think it might be the well either that or the gallbladder is the well okay they're kind of they're kind of similar and i think one is like the general one's the commander mm -hmm. or, or something like that um, i love that explanation but yeah well no it is it is the well you're right it is the well i i remember um okay. and it's actually you want to hear something interesting for the energetics so um there's so i i do martial arts muay thai mm -hmm. like it's like kickboxing but um 
what I've noticed also from watching fights and having the experience myself is if you ever get hit in the liver, like you get kicked in the liver or something like that, uh, you like literally lose the will to fight. Wow. You it completely like you just don't you just don't want to fight anymore if you get hit there. Obviously, there's like physiological reasons for that, but I look at it metaphorically too. Is like when that organ's damaged, you have no will. Like you have no willpower. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of kind of interesting connection there. No, that's good. I don't really, I, I know a little bit about the Chinese organ systems and their, you know, psycho-emotional components, because I do, I feel like the, the, the psycho-emotional component of the organs really important. And I've seen that with like liver, um, you know, women that have a lot of, I call it liver, we call it liver stagnation, right? Like things are moving in the liver the way they should, not eliminating the way they should. A lot of uh, women tend to get like PMS symptoms or like a lot of anger, irritability, you know, at mm. times when the liver is taxed. And, um, you know, I, I definitely feel like when you're able to address the liver or also address those emotions that the physiology evens out and the psychology evens out because they're right. definitely interrelated. Yeah. And it, it, you don't even really need to get into anything incredibly mystical to explain why that's the case. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the, the liver is a big uh, uh, helps in production of the hormones and detoxifying them. And obviously if you have a hormonal imbalance, like you have an excess or a low level, uh, it's going to affect your mood a lot. So it's really simple. Why? Like if your if your liver is not functioning, right. You, why you would not feel good, but there's a hundred other reasons. Liver is in fact, one of the most fascinating organs because it seems to just do everything. It seems that it's the organ that seems to be involved in every process somehow. I know it's like the main organ like you could not live without your liver you can live without your gallbladder you know granted there's some things that wouldn't yeah. be gone right but you cannot live without your liver but it can regenerate that's the coolest thing yeah it exactly it has this amazing regenerative um, anabolic capabilities like it's simultaneously participating in anabolism like building things up and catabolism breaking things down in like this beautiful orchestration of cellular yeah. energy it really if i was if i was to say that the vital force lived in an organ i'd probably say it lives in the liver you know i can kind of feel that <laughs> right yeah. it seems like i mean just the the fact of its regeneration i want to mm-hmm. uh, so i i read somewhere that the the liver will completely regenerate within it was some remarkably short period of time. I don't know if it was 24 or 48 hours or a week or something like that, but it'll completely regenerate if only a third of it is remaining. So if literally something came in and bit out two thirds of your liver, your liver would come back, regenerate within a very short period of time. No other organ does that no. except maybe the skin to some extent. It has pretty good healing. Um, but other than most organs, you know, you take a chunk out of it. That's it. That organ's done for your brain done for lungs done for heart done for liver it comes back which is very very strange that's amazing i don't think i i knew that but i don't think i heard that stat so that's that's wild that's wild how cool yeah it seems to be the that force of kind of vitality regeneration life uh it's an important organ that gets beat down all the Uh time from what we eat uh from obviously all the you know toxicants in our environment food yeah. pesticides that it has to deal with and uh plastics which are obviously they they mimic uh hormones and then they that the liver has to deal with that so it, it's just it's the most ragged on organ in the body for sure it definitely takes on the brunt of detoxification yeah absolutely and when it's not functioning properly the body is just it's not happy that's for sure yeah, I remember uh, uh, Dr. Callens was always, there was almost this kind of, so Dr. Callens was a, a professor and also a doctor at uh, NUNM for a while. And a and genius. He, yeah, he is a, definitely a genius. And he was very, like, such an expert at herbalism and energetics and knew all the traditions. But there was this meme around him where it, it was kind of like he would just always treat the liver. We had, like, a joke where, mm-hmm. like, he would ask us, like, when we were on his chefs, like, what do you like, what do you guys think we should do? And we'd be like, oh, treat the liver. And he'd be, he'd oh, just yeah. like laugh, but he'd be like, yeah. <laughs> so like if when in doubt, that. treat the liver. For most people, right? When it comes down to the organs of elimination, which we could all use improvement upon, it's like that liver is this is, is like the main, you know, organ. And so if you focus on that, usually, you know, cascade effects, everything else can kind of improve, but that's too funny. Yeah, with him was the liver and, um, 
I was always working on the HPA axis too. Yeah, 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 exactly. Has some sort of nervous system and adrenal system dysregulation. Yep, yep, exactly. But. So there's this interesting idea. I believe uh, is it called Herring's law? Mm-hmm. Uh, that you know the pathology in the body it it moves as it goes through a progression to kind of uh, resolving itself. So uh, conditions, if they're getting worse, they go from bottom to top. And they go from out to in. That's if a condition is getting worse. But mm-hmm. if it's getting better, aka there's a healing response or detoxification is happening, it goes from center to out and from top to down. Uh, meaning that when you have skin breakouts and things like this, at least within that system of thinking, it actually is not necessarily a bad thing. But what it's saying is that something is being moved out of your body. So if you suddenly get a skin breakout, it might actually be a sign that you're finally detoxing something that it's, it's come to the surface, as they say, what do you, what do you think about that idea? Have you actually seen that in practice? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Bogdan, absolutely. I completely agree with that. Um, and one thing that I tell my clients and my patients with acne is, you know, in some ways, yeah, it sucks. It totally sucks to have things showing up on your skin, but in another way, it's like a blessing. Your body is so freaking wise. And instead of taking those, you know, cellular waste products, toxins, whatever. And like saying, okay, I don't know what to do with this. So I'm going to shove it in your joints, shove it in your vessels, like do something else with it. It's like, no, I know how to get it. I get this out. Like, let me send it out through the skin. Um, you know, so that that's like a blessing, right? Our bodies are so wise. They know how to get rid of things. Now it's like, okay, now we got to focus on getting your body to eliminate in just a more physiological and, and a healthier way. Um, the other thing too is, yeah, when somebody's having a healing response, um, you know, I've witnessed this numerous times. You give someone a remedy, homeopathic or an herb, and you're trying to get their body to restore function mm-hmm. or maybe move through old traumas even. So it doesn't even have to be physical. The body all of a sudden is like, wow, I get to release all this stuff. So maybe they're releasing all of the excess xenoestrogens they've had in their fat cells and it comes through their liver and it's just too much. And so their body has to throw it out through the skin and there's a healing reaction. So Mm. definitely the skin is telling the the skin and any sort of skin condition is there. Those symptoms are just the body communicating, like what is it doing, how it's healing, how you can best support it. And um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I think that's the key difference with the holistic approach to uh, skin health and the traditional, uh, meaning conventional rather, uh, is that just because there's an issue with the skin doesn't mean that you should necessarily just put something on the skin. It, it is a call to look uh, deeper and see what are the things that are causing it internally. So a lot of the kind of skincare uh, from an herbalist are a lot of these liver supporting herbs and other detoxifying herbs because the idea is you help support the body kind of uh, detox from whatever condition it's trying to expel through the uh, skin rather than you know just putting something on the skin. Um, I know you were telling me that you had pretty bad acne at some time in your life. I was interested in like what exactly you did that kind of helped uh, clear it out and like what do you think is most effective for people that have like really severe acne. Yeah, no, thanks for asking. Uh, Yeah, I did have really severe acne um, not too long ago, actually. It was when I discontinued the hormonal birth control pill Mm. about three months later, which is typical three to six months is usually when it occurs. I just like overnight broke out in severe cystic acne all over my face, my my neck, my chest, my back, um, something I'd never experienced before, aside from like the random whitehead I'd get every now and then. Um, but I went down this rabbit hole. It was before naturopathic school and like right at the very beginning of naturopathic school. But I went down this rabbit hole of trying to figure out like what's causing my acne? Like, how can I heal this? Like I got off birth control so I didn't have to be on medications. I didn't want to go back on like Accutane or go on another medication to mm-hmm. heal it. So I knew there had to be a natural way. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the work I did at first is trying to like figure out nutrients that could be supportive. And some of it was helpful at first. I made some big dietary changes and move, removing um, inflammatory, inflammatory foods that were worsening the systemic inflammation and um, that my gut was reacting to. And, you know, we can dive into that later, but ultimately addressing the gut is deeper than just removing food sensitivities. But I did that and um, things started to improve about 50%. 
And um, I worked with herbs to help balance my hormones because I also wasn't menstruating after the birth control pill. So once I was able to increase my progesterone with herbs, and once I was able to clean out my liver and my amunctories with a lot of these supportive herbs, um, that's when the healing happened. So mm. that's how I did it. It took some time. It took some experimentation. Um, but at the time I had like no knowledge of any of, of much natural medicine at all. So it was quite the journey. Yeah. That's so do you think that when you stopped taking the, uh, uh, contraceptive that, you like your body started kind of expelling whatever was in itself like all at once absolutely i mean i'll be real honest here when i was on the birth control pill like many women i gained weight um and that weight uh you know holds on to adipose tissue holds on to xenoestrogens right, right? holds on to real estrogens hold on to xenoestrogens and i feel like that's almost um well one estrogen builds tissue in the body but then also it's like a protective me mechanism. You're taking high doses of these hormones that don't normally exist at that high amount mm -hmm. and your body has to excrete it somewhere. If the liver can't keep up, it's going to hold on to it until it can release it mm. at a later date. So I feel like when you, when you stop birth control, things start to kind of normalize. And then eventually you just hit this point where your body's like freedom and it just like spills it all out. Mm -hmm. And um, that's like when I started losing the weight, when I started breaking out, when like all of like my hormones just seemed so chaotic. Uh, but I feel like that's the body's like healing attempt. Like it finally realizes like, okay, I can heal. It throws things out. There's this, you know, healing crisis. And um, because the birth control pill is such in my opinion, a very toxic substance, and you're, we're on it for years, mm -hmm. it takes time to heal from that. It's not overnight by any means. Mm. Yeah, it's it's amazing because they kind of just give those out like candy, basically, like as if taking some, you know, intense hormone is just, uh, I, I don't I don't understand it, to, to, to be frank, especially when it's kind of used to treat all sorts of different conditions. Um, but that's, that's kind of how the conventional approach is, you know, as long as it has some research that it kind of works. And as long as there's no research that it kills people, it'll be used. That's <laughs> well, pretty it much kill people. It could kill people. Yeah. But I know, I know the, the birth control pill is, you know, talking about that is something that I'm, I'm passionate about. I love, you know, helping women get off the pill because that's really important. Many women don't know that it's a process. They think, oh, I can stop the pill and get pregnant or stop the pill and get my periods and stop the pill and be fine. And for, I would say a good 80 to 90% of women, that's not the case. Um, it's a healing process. Um, and also talking about alternatives to birth control if women are on it or if they are thinking about becoming on, going on it or their daughter's going on it. Um, because I was like, you know, I, I got my period when I was a teenager and immediately within two months, I had like these, I went on the birth control pill because I had these crazy, heavy, long periods. And that was my body just trying to like figure stuff out. Right. Mm -hmm. But the doctor's like, here, this will balance your hormones when mm -hmm. that is not at all what it does. It does not yeah. balance your hormones, yeah. um, but it shut him down effectively for, you know, yeah. seven, eight years. And it that, never yeah. learned how to, you know, my body never learned how to have a balanced period until a few years ago. That's the issue with a lot of these medications is they really seem to work. But when, when you take them away, you see that they were never working. They were just suppressing whatever was happening. Uh, yeah. And then you have it even double after. So mm -hmm. especially uh, you mentioned Accutane. That isn't Accutane like one of the most toxic pharmaceuticals that exists? Yeah, it really is. And it's because it's a high dose of a synthetic vitamin A. So it's mm. not even like a, a vitamin A you would naturally find in food sources. And it's a really, really high dose. And when you have a fat soluble vitamin in high doses, um, one fat soluble, it stays around in your system longer. So it gets stored and sort of can accumulate over time. Mm. But Accutane is really well known for um, causing uh, liver damage for one. So mm. before you go on Accutane, you have to have your liver enzymes tested, make sure your liver is doing okay. If you have any liver disease, it's a contraindication. Um, so, you know, that just tells you up front, like, oh, this, this, you know, drug that I'm taking to help clear my skin is impairing an organ that is known to be dysfunctional <laughs> in many people with hormonal yeah. imbalances. And acne. Yeah, that's kind of funky. Uh, so it boggles my mind a little bit. But the other thing with, um, uh, Accutane, oh, what was I going to say about that? Um, the other thing with Accutane is that, well, it is a long course. It's like six months that you have to mm. be on it. And, and most of the time what I see is women will go on it, they'll get clear skin and then slowly the acne will start creeping back. And I think if I remember the, um, 
the recent stats that I read, it's, they don't know, but it's somewhere between like 30 to even up to six, 60 or 70% of people have to do it again because their acne comes back. So again, it's like not treating- Not dealing with it at a deep level. It's kind of just- suppressing that process whatever it is that's causing the acne exactly and i'd much rather like i'd much rather work with them like if they want to go the vitamin a route work on like getting their own endogenous stores of vitamin a up like why do why are they not like producing enough vitamin a you know we could even discuss topical vitamin a like there's so many ways Mm. that you could go the vitamin a route without like doing accutane Mm. what are some other uh topicals that you uh that you like for uh acne and things like this like things to actually put on the skin yeah so i feel like i tell my clients and my patients that when it comes to acne skincare depending on the individual can be like it's like five to ten percent of the healing like it definitely can play a role but ultimately most of the healing comes from within Mm -hmm. um, and addressing the internal environment but for topical skincare throw out all of those ingredients or throw all those products with ingredients you can't pronounce that are full of um, petroleum-based products and xenoestrogens because, you know, that's just going to hinder the healing process, right? The skin absorbs everything you put on it that goes to your liver to be detoxified. Like, let's just cut those out. Um, In terms of things that are actually beneficial, I love DIY. I make my own skincare products, Mm -hmm. herbs, um, calendula infused olive oil is like my base for everything. And you could do anything with that, right? You could do anything with calendula based um, olive oils, Uh, mixing in like shea butter, cocoa butter for the vitamin E um, can be really, really nice. Little beeswax to hold it together. Any sort of essential oils like frankincense or clary sage or things that might be good for the skin. Another thing, I just love just any sort of oils. Most of the time with acne, it actually, there's dry skin. People think Mm -hmm. that mostly oily skin, but actually adding oils to the skin can help acne in most cases, not every case, but in most cases. So working a lot with herbal infused oils or just even plain jojoba oil, argan oil, rose hip oil can be nice. And then lastly, one other thing that I really love for the skin, there's all sorts of like acids and all sorts of things out there with, which can be helpful, but some detrimental. Um, but vitamin C serum is something that I tell a lot of people about, and there's some good ones out there. Um, but I, I, I love that for reducing inflammation and just like helping with healing. Um, that combined with like a calendula or else I'm just like, oh, you can do magic. Mm. Yeah, I made this big batch of uh, uh, calendula tincture with uh, fresh calendula. Mm-hmm such a such a great herb it's it's pretty bitter and intense but in terms of uh strength it's it's so good for like immune system health for clearing out uh lymphatics that's Mm -hmm. it's one of those specifics of it like anybody who has like very you know like swollen glands or any kind of issue with that um it's great it's also beautiful too it's like beautiful gorgeous i have some growing outside i've been kind of harvesting it all spring and summer or summer i guess it's when it bloom but yeah no it's great it's it's wonderful and it's great to take internally too because as you said like lymphatic so we're talking about calendula and being like kind of a an alternative or like a cleansing herb mm-hmm. for lymphatics i've also seen it be um useful for leaky gut, you know, the mm. intestinal hyper, hyper permeability and helping heal those tight junctions and helping with food sensitivities. Um, because ultimately, you know, food sensitivities come down to nervous system and, and, and those kinds of imbalances rather than just the gut. But Right. So uh, last, last episode, we talked a lot about astrological herbalism. Ah, so yeah. uh, what's going on right now, astrologically <laughs> for anyone who's interested, because I don't know what's going on. Oh, all. Oh gosh, there's so many. There's so many planets in Capricorn, which have literally been like why 2020 has been like the way it is. Yeah. Uh, Saturn and Jupiter and all sorts of stuff. Um, but yeah, let's see what's going on right now. So Mars has been in Aries since what, June, July? I can't remember. But Mars is going to be in Aries until like the very beginning of January. Mars in Aries. So the, the, the fighter warrior exactly. planet with the aggressive sign. That's also warrior based. Okay. Yeah. So like this warrior planet in this like very um, kind of self-important sign, but we love Aries, right? They're, they're just very like proud and confident and, and they just take up space, right? And Aries is, or Mars is like that warrior go, go, go. Mm-hmm. So Mars is happy hanging out in Aries for six whole months. Usually Mars is only in a planet for about two-ish, two and a half months. Um, but because it's been retrograde since the middle of September and for another month until the middle of November, that's why it's hanging on Aries longer. So we've got Mars retrograde in Aries right now, kind of during this crazy time, right? September, October into November. 
And, you know, when we think of like Mars and Aries, it likes to have this outward energy, but with this retrograde, we're kind of turning it in. We're turning um, this intense go, go, go energy inward. And it can kind of feel stifling or um, like frustrating, like anger can come up because Mars can stir up heat, right? It can mm. stir up anger and volatility. So I feel like the next, maybe you've been feeling it since mid-September and probably for the next few weeks, but just this kind of like inner like fire this inner frustration with mm. the way things might be in the world um but we're going to go into scorpio season which i think might change things up a little bit so we just had our new moon in libra and going into scorpio season scorpio is ruled by mars so it might feel a little bit more at home there when we're dealing with this mars uh, retrograde energy while we're in um scorpio season so but I do think things are going to come up. I mean, once we get into Scorpio, we're talking about like shadow work. We're talking about transformation. We're talking about like um, facing our fears, like all those taboo subjects we talk about, like it's because we're afraid of really diving into what that means for us and our human psyche. So I've, you know, thinking about this type of energy, the Scorpio energy that's coming up with this Mars and Aries energy. I mean, it's just a lot of working on like working on you know those fears and working with with plant medicine too i don't know we can we can just dive into like what plant medicine might be nice but yeah i i i definitely want to dive into that but i also i want to share a story because it's so weird about the scorpio yes. aspect yes. okay so i had a dream a few years ago really intense dream it was on my birthday it was on my birthday night um and i made i made a wish i forget exactly what the wish was but it was something like you know for me to find my way, my mission, my path, whatever. This was before naturopathic. This was when I was still uh, doing a philosophy major at Stony Brook in New York. And so I go to sleep that night and in the dream, I kind of like wake up. I have this thing where I like fall into these kind of in-between sleep states where like I'm like in my room, but maybe I'm dreaming. I don't know if it's like open-eyed dreaming or a vision or whatever it is, but it happens you, to me. Is it sleep paralysis? Do you ever get that? Yeah, I do get sleep paralysis, but in this case, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, I don't, actually, maybe it was sleep paralysis. Hard to remember exactly, but I do get sleep paralysis a lot and I'll get like open eyed visions while I'm having it because I kind of like, like to stay in it. I don't like knock mm -hmm. myself out of it because I just, you know, you see such weird things happen. Anyway, well, so I've got a scary sleep paralysis story if you ever want to hear one. Please, <laughs> after, right after this, I love, <laughs> I love talking about sleep paralysis because everyone who has it thinks that they're the only person who has it. So it's good oh, to yeah. kind of normalize it. Uh -huh. Anyway, so in this dream, I'm kind of laying back and I'm in my room and I'm something is someone is talking to me, but I can't see them like some some entity or some being is talking to me um, and they're asking me all sorts of questions. And one of the questions that they oh, actually, this is freaking weird. Um, the first thing that they say to me, and this gives me even chills, is like they they say your, your, your wish is granted. That's what, that's what, whatever. So I'm in this like weird sleep process in between state. I hear your wish is granted. I'm like, what the hell? And then this, whatever is talking to me, it's not anywhere. It seems like, you know, it's over there somewhere, but I can't see anything. It seems like it's talking internally, but in a different voice, not my voice. Um, and it asked me, you know, what is the meaning of full moon in Scorpio? which is like really at this time I was kind of interested in astrology, but I didn't really like understand what that meant. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and what I said was my response. I thought about, I thought about it and I didn't really know how to respond to it. I think I said something like, Oh, I remember what I said. I said, I said, um, I said, it's about finding the, the light within the darkness. That's, that's what Ooh. I said in my dream. And then I kind of started doubting myself for some reason, because whatever didn't respond back to me after I said that. So I was kind of like, oh, well, I don't know. It depends on context. And mm -hmm. the second I said context, I got like pulled, like, I don't know, a thousand miles an hour to like a center spot in my room. And right in front of me was like, some kind of like, I don't even know. It must've been like some image of death or something. It was like this, like, oh. uh, like person who seemed to be sitting in some kind of chair, but they were like decaying and they were like black and dark and just like literally an image of death. As the, as I got pulled, there was like 
the second I got pulled and saw this figure, I heard, you know, like the Jack in the box sound when it pops out mm -hmm. like, Bring! like that. I heard that the second I got pulled and uh, no lie. I woke up in such a fright that I don't even know how to explain it because I, oh my gosh. I don't know how to explain like the, the, what was really strange about it all is the suddenness of it. Like, it felt like I was like pulled out of my body. Like I'm saying like a thousand miles an hour to like a spot in my room and then saw this and like just got startled awake. So it was really startling. Um, but anyway, I woke up and then all that day, I felt kind of like weird. I felt kind of like sickish. I felt kind of like out of it, had cold chills all day. It was really, it was a really freaking weird experience. You feel like anyway, granted? I, I guess, it, I guess it, I guess it was, I guess it was like, I, I view that kind of as something that actually occurred. Like, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. But anyway, the, the whole Scorpio thing was really weird. So whenever a Scorpio full moon comes around, I'm just kind of like scared a little bit. Cause I don't know what, like, I'm just like always a little bit like, uh, I don't know. Is this, is this thing going to come true? Whatever I was talking about or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's my, that's my creepy story for, for oh. Halloween times. That's good. I know. Isn't it like fitting that Halloween is in the middle of Scorpio season? It's such an eerie time of the year. Like I totally understand why it's this, mm -hmm. this time. So it, and it happens right before Sagittarius season, which is like this gregarious outward, like, ah, kind of, kind of season. Exactly. So. My, my favorite sign. Cause I'm a Sagittarius. Oh yeah. Me too. Yeah. We rock. Oh Sagittarius. yeah. Right. We were both Sagittarius. That's why I know, we're I awesome. I always get excited about that. But. Yeah. So, uh, what, can you share your uh, sleep paralysis story? I'm interested. Okay, if you're really scared of of, of scary nightmares, maybe don't listen to this part. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they're listening so far, they're they're already into it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was actually like eight years ago or something, and I was just taking a nap in the middle of the day. For some reason, sleep paralysis tends to occur more for me when I'm napping mm -hmm. because I think you're kind of more in that in between. I've had that experience as well. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it happens so often when I nap. So I don't nap that much, but um, because, so I was just napping on my bed and all of a sudden, like I, you know, you kind of wake up, your eyes open, you mm -hmm. feel like you're awake, but you can't move your body, sleep yep. paralysis. It's like that, it's like your, your brain has shut off your muscles. And so in that moment, you know, you want to try to relax, right? Because if you can relax, you can actually get into the experience. Mm -hmm. I've always... I've always had such a hard time with that. I fight it. I try to like move my hands, move my feet and just like jolt myself away, yeah. which happens eventually. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I kind of open my eyes and I, I see like, not kidding, six cent style at the foot of my bed, these like naked bloody bodies hanging oh. by their neck, just staring at me with like big eyes and their blood, like all down their bodies. Just naked bodies. And I freak out and I look to my left I like, cause I'm lying on my back and I can only move my eyes and I'm looking to my left and I see this person on my pillow next to me, same oh, thing, no. body, blood, like staring at me, mouth oh, open Jesus Christ. in inches of my face. Uh, and I scream, uh, but I can't scream because my vocal cords aren't working. <laughs> so oh my eventually I like Jesus don't Christ. myself awake, but you interpret dreams. What does that mean? Let's get into it. I mean- <laughs> I've had that, like, that hits me so viscerally because in sleep paralysis, I've had that experience where I, like, look over and something's, like, near me. And it's, like, it's oh, the worst thing that could happen in that state. Um, mm -hmm. Firstly, when did this happen? What's the time context? Was this, like, a long time ago or? Oh, it was, well, it's, yeah, it was probably about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it might be a little bit tougher to interpret because a lot of the context might be missing from the daily life. But, uh Let's try. So the first thing that struck me is like the bloody bodies. Like, what did that make you think of? Was there something in your life at the time that you were thinking about things like that? Or what did it like remind you of? Like, what was your impression of like why it was there? Yeah, that's uh, interesting. I wish I could go back and know what I was thinking during the time, but I think it just scared me so much. I had no idea. But um, I, yeah, during the time I was going through a lot of transitions, I was dealing with my hormonal acne. I was, I was healing from lots of previous traumas that had happened just a couple of years prior. I um, was on, on the way to move in a few months to Portland actually. Um, so there was just a lot of change in my life, a lot of healing of traumas. 
That's all I can think of. Who do you think they were? Like, I the the thing that came to my mind was like something Inquisition based. Like, I don't know why, but that's what it kind of struck me as. But was there anything that you thought it was at the time? Like, what context they were in? Like, why were they? No, I can't. I I wish I could. I don't. Yeah, know. it's a tough one because it, it, like if you if it was more recent, then we can kind of work with uh, like what's happening in your life, and then we probably could have a good answer. But I don't know. Sometimes I wonder. Sometimes sleep paralysis, the things that happen are just terrifying, and they don't like. But who is like, terrifying you? Like your own mind is like messing with you. Like I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, yeah. I had another weird sleep paralysis experience while we're talking about them. Um, this one's really scary too. Uh, so what I noticed with sleep paralysis, it's very strange because like you said, you're laying there, you can't move. Um, I had the experience. I don't know if you had this, that your whole body is just like tingling. It feels like electricity is just, it just feels like everything. Like it doesn't feel like you're numb. It feels like you're electrified or something. You have this experience. Um, and uh, when I'm in that state, I open my eyes and I actually, I see the environment I'm in. So like, if I want to sleep in my room, I see my room, mm -hmm. but I have like hallucinations that are like, almost like, um, what's that, uh, modified, like augmented reality. You know how augmented reality is like, it, you're still in the same place, but you see things. It's like exactly like that. Yeah, it's I'm like everything is just layered over what the room you're in. Like you see your room, but then you see things on top of it. You exactly. Know? It's like, you don't, you don't like have a hallucination that you're in a different place. It's just in the room, but something happens in it really weird. And it's incredibly consistent, which makes me think that what's happening is you're falling asleep, your body falls asleep, but you kind of wake up. And now this process of dreams and visualization that occurs internally is now being projected on the external environment because your eyes are open. And I have evidence for this. Um, that your eyes are actually open when it's happening sometimes, mm -hmm. which is really creepy. Um, yeah. Anyway, so one time, uh, it's this really interesting night. I had been, I met some guy at, at a bar and we talked for like five hours about all these conspiracies and just all this crazy stuff all night. So I, I came home like three in the morning and I was already in like a kind of weird head space. Like, anyway, so I go to sleep and I just suddenly like, I'm, I'm like sleeping. And then I see, like, I suddenly see w my room. Like I, so I'm like laying in my bed like this and my, imagine my doors across from me directly. Cause my bed's like, like this. And then the doors over here. So I have a clear view of the door. I see walking in my door, some figure that is completely dark, but they have what looks like this, like triangle hood, like this, like, I don't even know. It looked like one of those if you look at those old, uh, like, I don't know if it was like the Inquisition or something like that, but they would wear these really weird hoods, like these mm -hmm. pointed like monk hoods. But this whole figure was completely black and you couldn't see anything. It was just like, imagine a shadow with like a pointed, very, very high hood. Anyway, so I literally, I think I started screaming, I'm pretty sure, but I was not in control of such things. Um, and then like, it came closer to me and then it touched me. And then I, like, I kind of came to, and it was my mom. She just kind of like walked in my room at night to check on me. Oh wow! Um, but so what happened was I superimposed this image in the dark on this, but what was really freaking weird is what she said. She got, she got scared actually, because she said she walked in my room and she walked in my room and all of a sudden I just opened my eyes. Like, so that's what happened. So I like, I, that's my evidence that you're actually, when you have an open eyed like thing, like your eyes are actually open. So you're actually hallucinating with your eyes open. Anyway, that one was really freaking weird. That's crazy. That's, that's so crazy. <laughs> yeah, I know. I love scared the crap the out of me. I know. I think you could get lost down like Reddit yeah. threads of sleep. Yeah. This yeah, these are, just, like, these, these are are real cool. life spooky stories, you know? You don't even have to go to a haunted house, just uh have sleep paralysis happen to you and you'll have exactly. you'll have fun. But um <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a strange phenomenon. And I noticed too that I would have it a lot 
if I nap during the day, but it would be different. My experience would be different during the day. It tended to be more positive during the day. Uh, more like you, it would seem like there's like light outside if you fall asleep in that state. Whereas at night it would be like dark if I had a sleep paralysis experience. So it's like somehow it's in tune with whatever's actually happening. But what I noticed is that the sleep paralysis would happen when I was really, really tired. If I was really, really tired, like where I could just close my eyes and fall asleep instantly type of tired. Uh, and I lay down on my back, it almost always would happen. Same. Yeah. Cause like the only reason I'd be taking naps in the middle of the day was because I was really, really tired. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's almost, I think it's like when you're so, so tired, like your body falls asleep so quickly that like your mind is still kind of like awakeish, mm -hmm. And that's what allows you to have that kind of weird uh, experience of like, your body's in the sleep state, which is actually the paralysis happens so that you don't flail around all night when you're dreaming, but you're not actually dreaming because your eyes are open. You're not having an internal experience. You still feel like you're in your body. Yeah. Very strange. Actually, all the, the astral projection stuff can happen from that state. I don't know if you've had that experience, but I've actually, I haven't. I've, I've read about it and I've heard about people doing it and I've tried, but it's just every single time. And I, I think it's because I, a good amount of time goes between my sleep paralysis events yeah. but when i finally find myself in sleep paralysis it's like i can't get myself to calm down i just freak out yep 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 that's yeah that's what usually happens with sleep paralysis you instantly just want to get out of it because not only is it weird that your body has all these sensations and you can't move but like like we're talking about all these hallucinations and stuff that happen when you're in it they're very disconcerting and they're rarely positive like in my experience they're always like something scary or like it doesn't, if there's a figure next to you in your bed, looking at you, it doesn't matter if they're like Jesus, like you're going to get scared shitless regardless. Like you don't, that's not <laughs> well, something you want happening. And look like they're dead. Yeah, exactly. Like the cherry on top. But, but the cool thing with astral projection is from that state of sleep paralysis, what you do is one, you try not to like panic, which is hard because it's not like a very pleasant state to be in a mm -hmm. lot of times. Um, and then you, there's a few different ways you can do it. Uh, but the main idea is like moving out of your body. Like, I don't know how to explain it, but you have to like move out of your body. Have you done it? I have, yeah. And so like one of the ways you can do it is like, imagine you're like laying down flat. You can like feel yourself like rotate and then try to like get up. Or you can just get up like this. Like you have to move, like, I, I don't know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. what I kind of explain it as like move from your chest, like move, like, cause you don't want to actually move. Cause it'll knock you out. It's, it's weird, but I've actually had the experience that I got into an astral projection from it. So I know that there's something weird going on, that there's some, mm -hmm. there's some legitimacy to it because a lot of the time I would have astral projections that just happen spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Like I would just like wake up in my room and be floating around, moving around and stuff. Uh -huh. But this, uh, at least one, if not two times, I actually purposely got into astral projection from the sleep paralysis state. So ever since then, I was just like, there's some weird stuff going on that I can't explain. Was it like, easy to come back into your body? It kind of just happens automatically. Yeah, you like if you want it. it. If you like want it. Dreaming. Exactly. Like, like if you threat. really like move, if you like move like physically you'll wake up and come back in your body or if you get overly excited you'll just wake up and come back to your body what happens you don't, to me dreaming all the time me. <laughs> you don't have to like go back to your body in the astral projection you'll just like automatically wake up back into it but uh and i had a weird experience so a lot of people t say with the astral projections that when they look at their uh body it's there but i never saw myself i would always look at the bed and it'd be empty always Every, and i've had a lot of them Wow. which is really weird. Like I would see it as like empty. It would look like an empty bed. So I don't know what that means. I don't know if I'm a vampire or something. I don't know. <laughs> You're bringing up such cool points and it makes me want to, you know, have a sleep paralysis event soon to try it out. Easy. But, just, uh, uh, I... just be sleep deprived and then <laughs> lay down on your back or in uh -huh. any position that you don't normally sleep in and it'll happen. It's pretty much well, guaranteed. It makes me think of when I was a kid, I feel like kids have such a more they're they have such an easier time of getting into their astral body yeah because when i was a kid every single night like this is every night before i would fall asleep i would i feel like i was playing around with my astral body while i was fully awake because i would lay in my mattress in my bed and i would just feel my body kind of like moving through space and i'd pretend i was like on these roller coasters and moving and i would like 
I would make myself like spin in circles and I would physically feel like I was like spinning. Yeah. My legs were getting intertwined and I could move around and go up and down and I was awake. Yep. That's, 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 yeah, that's what it sounds like. And I, yeah, I had a lot of spontaneous experiences like that, especially when I was younger, they don't happen uh, as, as often to me anymore, which I'm kind of thankful for to some degree because it's very disruptive to sleep. Like if you have a night, because the weird thing with the astral projection and sleep paralysis is you can do it all night long. Meaning like, because when you come back, you're already very primed to just do it again. So there'd be times where I would like move out of sleep paralysis like have an experience, then I would just like go back and go back. And there are times where I did it, like, I don't even know, like 15 or 20 times in a single night oh my where God. I just kept like, because when you're, for whatever reason, when you get into it once, it's really easy to get into it again. If you just kind of like relax, like you'll notice yourself just slip into it automatically repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So I had experiences where I was doing it all night and you, you don't get any, like, it's not restful sleep, whatever projection or sleep paralysis is like, it's like not even sleeping. It's weird. So weird. Oh God. That's so cool that you were able to do that so many times. Yeah. And I, I still, I, another thing that I noticed was really interesting I, in my dream psychology class that I teach for PCC. I kind of talked extensively about one of the astral projection stories I had. Mm -hmm. um, what I noticed is there was like almost certain phys, uh, physics laws in whatever this place is, which makes me think that it's an actual real place that you go when you astral project. So one of the things I noticed is every time I'd have the astral projection, there was always this like really strong gravity downwards. Like everything, it's like, it was always trying to pull you into the ground, whatever that state was. Um, I was on the second floor, but I would get pulled into the ground. And what would happen is you get pulled into the ground and then you, you end up in this black space. And then in a second or two, you get spit back up and you're back in normal place. There was literally a time where I, I, I was just going up and down. Like I just kept getting pulled in the ground, going in the back space, waiting a few seconds, getting shot back up. And I just kept doing that. I don't know, 10 or 15 times, like so consistently that I just noticed this thing that there's, especially at night, there's this gravitation downwards. But during the day when I had astral projections, there was a gravitation upwards. I felt like I was always being pulled upwards. It was easier to fly. I felt like it was more natural. Whereas during the night, it took me a lot of willpower to move up. Like if I wanted to, you know, exit out my window and fly up, like it took so much willpower to move up because there was so much like what felt like gravity pulling me down. Um, whereas, like I said, during the daytime is just the opposite. I felt like I just naturally got pulled up and it was very easy to fly. So I, and I had that happen to me so many times that I was like, is there some kind of like rules in this place? Because like, I don't know why my mind keeps consistently creating these same like experiences mm -hmm. of, so I don't know. It's weird. It's weird stuff. And it's, outside of, you know, my experiences with psychedelics, it's like my evidence to myself that there's something beyond this world that we don't understand at all that like definitely exists, but who oh, knows what that means for us. Yeah, absolutely. Close your eyes. You can feel it. You know, it's there. Yeah, definitely. But I hope I get some crazy sleep paralysis tonight. Now I've been talking about it so much. I haven't had it happen. Well, in, hopefully uh, it's like possible while, though. Actually. Sleep, with sleep paralysis, I, yeah. I don't know if I've ever had any like good hallucinations with sleep paralysis. You can, you can. I've, I've had some like amazing experiences, like one of them. Uh, and maybe what kind of helps is just close your eyes when you're in the sleep paralysis instead mm -hmm. of opening them. I had this sleep paralysis where I felt like I was kind of going into sleep paralysis. I always know it because like, there's this weird sign that I've read about and I've also noticed to be true is you'll notice like certain parts of your body get really, really itchy and like you just want to scratch them for some reason. Um, and I read, and this kind of makes sense is that this is almost like your body testing you to see if you're really asleep. It's a really weird way to think about it because you know, if you move to itch, you're going to wake up out of it. But I would like wait and not do that. It might just be a nervous system thing also, but I would feel like the tingle start and then I would, Ting more, more and more tingling and then the kind of numbness. And then I would be in the sleep paralysis. This one time I was there and my eyes were closed and I was moving through a tunnel, like really fast. It was like all sorts of rainbow colors and beautiful. And it was like really exhilarating. Like it was like a really good feeling. 
it felt like very like ecstatic. I'm moving through this tunnel and I, I'm listening to one of my favorite singers sing, but I'm like giving him the words. So like I'm singing through his voice to myself while I'm flying through this tunnel. Anyway, it was awesome. So it doesn't I always have, have to be the, bad. I've had, okay. I have had, you the, had tunnel the tunnel. Experience. You had the tunnel. The tunnel I think is universal. I almost feel like the tunnel reminds me of like a double helix and I'm just like, moving through it and it's all yeah it's colorful but it exists in like this big black who universe whatever it is yep, but this, yep. you know what i mean yep it's like the tunnel and then all how, how okay if you're listening to this right now please comment with an explanation for how the hell any of this is possible like without some kind of weird explanation <laughs> or please. if they have the same experience yeah I think universal i think how so are they consistent like how are how is that consistent like and Okay, you, maybe you could say, oh, well, it's the human psyche, so there's some similarities, right? But, like, why the hell do we have a psyche experience of a tunnel? Like, where the hell does that come from? I don't know. It feels almost too much like an umbilical cord. Maybe. I feel like I'm traveling through a double helix umbilical cord straight to, like, the source, whatever that is. There's some, I don't know, maybe, you know, all this idea of, like, black holes and wormholes and stuff. Like, maybe we can travel through them in this astral body or something. And that's what we do all the time when we're sleeping. Maybe that's what we do while we're asleep. Who knows? That's maybe that's how we actually recharge. We go, uh, this is like really conjecture and probably not true, but I'll have fun with it is when we go to sleep, our astral body goes into a black hole to re to regenerate, to get its energy back. Cause black holes, they take in all the light energy and stuff. Maybe that could be an explanation for why the tunnels are so bright and filled with all sorts of colors because they pull in all that light everywhere. Uh -huh. I like it. I like it. I could, I could drive with that. I can make sense of that. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. I also had the tunnel experience too on my uh, most significant uh, psilocybin experience. I had that experience of the tunnel mm -hmm. where I took a very high dose I mixed it in with like orange juice and I had been fasting for a day. So it like, it came on very suddenly, very intensely and very terrifyingly. And I was just sitting there with my friends and I was in that, uh, I don't know if you've ever done any psilocybin, but a lot of the times right in the beginning, especially when it's really strong, you might get this kind of almost panic response. Like you feel like uh, it's coming on and you feel like you're losing your mind. So like you feel like you feel yourself slipping away kind of thing, which is really an unpleasant feeling. Uh, anyway, so this was happening and it was incredibly terrifying and I just wanted it to stop. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. This was like 15 minutes into it. And I was already like checked out. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, so literally I like laid down, I closed my eyes and with all my willpower, I just like want, I just decided that I would rather die than experience this. So I just laid down. I was like, this is so bad. I don't want to experience this. Screw this. So I did that for, I don't know how long, but the weirdest thing is it's, it's so, it's so, uh, it's so unfortunate that I don't remember much of what happened when my eyes were closed uh, and wrote, wrote it down. Um, but all I remember is all sorts of tunnels, all sorts of colors. And when I came to, like when I came back into my body after this, I, was in such an ecstatic, blissful state that it's like hard to explain. And this was only 30 minutes into it where before I was in pure terror, like of, you know, existential terror, we can call it. And then I go through all this stuff after deciding to die. And then I come back and I'm just like, so blissful, like not even tripping, not even really seeing anything anymore. I'm just very happy. Everything's like glowing. And the first thought that comes into my mind, I was like so certain, I don't know why I was so certain that like death is not like actually possible. Like we think death is real, but like it's not, it's not actually possible to die. Um, so I came with that idea. And then for the next few hours, it was like, just, I don't know, it must've been something like a Satori experience or something where I, everything was very clear to me. I understood like my life, who I was, I was looking at my friend and his face was glowing and like everything was like in frames. I was like watching him move his hand and it looked like I could see it in like slow motion, but my mind was working very fast. Um, and just, a lot, it was a really good experience. But anyway, the reason I bring that up is because of the tunnel thing, like mm -hmm. whatever that tunnel thing is, I went through it and then I came back and I was like, I don't know, almost like reborn or something, at least for that day. But, That's um, amazing. 
Yeah, it's there's there's no the, explanation for that. Like I see the tunnel every night almost before I go to sleep. Mm. Like as I'm falling asleep and going into sleep, which is a, a death experience, you know, or yeah. maybe it's an awakening experience. We don't know. But like that mini death that we have every night, I feel like as soon as I go into it, it's like down this tunnel and then eventually I fall asleep. And sometimes yeah. when I'm in the tunnel, it's like I do get some of those like fractal uh, pattern hallucinations that occur mm -hmm. when you like take psychedelic yeah. as I'm in the tunnel, but it's like, I'm just going to sleep. Yeah. What is that? What, what do you think the tunnel is? I don't know. I think it's just, I don't know. I feel like it just transports you back to source, like back to home, back to, mm. you know, if this is a dream, it transports you back to, you know, what happens when we wake back up. Mm. There's a really interesting movie. It, I believe it's called Fearless. It's about this man who uh, survives this plane crash. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a, like a, probably like a 90s or early 2000s movie. He survives a plane crash. And then after that, he is like almost like enlightened. He's like afraid of nothing and he goes around. But I remember he like constantly or somebody else in the movie constantly draws like tunnels. They constantly draw these like colorful tunnels that they saw like when they died or had the near death experience or whatever. It's interesting that it's so consistent of an experience that even if it is like purely a psyche thing, it has some significance for it. But I don't think that it is purely just like a psyche thing. I think it's probably something else. Um, a lot of people, when they do DMT, they report being, you know, shot through some kind of tunnel into outer space or something. I've never done DMT, but I've heard that very commonly. So it's probably yeah. related. I imagine so. Yeah. I mean, I've never done DMT either, but I mean, it, gosh, yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. I wonder. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, if you guys have any strange experiences like about sleep paralysis or anything, be sure to uh, reach reach out to us. Yeah, let us know. I'd love to know. I don't want to feel alone in this. Yeah. And <laughs> if you've experienced like a <laughs> rainbow tunnel or something, definitely I'm very interested in hearing it. Um, and you can, so we'll, we'll kind of wrap up here since we've had such a, such a lovely episode. Love to do another one uh, and many more. Uh, I'd love to. So what is your Instagram handle for anyone who wants to follow you? Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram at Curtis, And uh, my website is wildrootsalchemy.com. I have a blog where I talk a lot about um, my work and um, with women's health, as well as with herbalism, astrological herbalism. So awesome. Yeah. And uh, my Instagram is Dr. Dan underscore medicine man can uh, find all what I'm up to, workshops, classes. I have one coming in uh, November, uh, Plant Energetics, if anything in this talk interested you. And if you want to pick up some of those organic tinctures, ktherbs.com and use the code uh, family and you'll get 25% off and free shipping. So if you want to get some nice organic tinctures sent to your house, visit there. Until oh, next time, uh, I'll see you on the other side of the tunnel. All right. Sounds good, Bogdan. Thanks for such a great interview.